now. So Tamoy, you can take it away. All right. Thank you, David. Nice to nice to see you again. Good to see you. And thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for the, actually, even from the beginning, thanks for setting up the platform, the Fresh Star Hub. When you mentioned it was a great initiative, I'm like, this actually makes complete sense. I wish I knew about this when I came to Canada or had something similar. So it's really great. And thanks for inviting me to, to come and speak. It's a great privilege to be here. And uh, hopefully I can share and even learn a lot from everyone. So like you said, my name is Tomiwa Omolulu. Uh, let's see, where do I start? I've been in Canada for since 2018. So let's say 20, uh, 12, 13 years. I came in uh, as an international student. I went to SOC for pre-university. I went to McMaster, did my undergrad in econ and math, um, graduated from McMaster, and then kind of started working, started my professional career. At least I was trying to start my professional career. After that, um, <clears throat> started working and then went back to school to do my master's while I was working about three years ago. And I kind of, you know, have been busy with that. I guess recently got married, so keeping busy with that as well. <laughs> but um, professionally, I mean, I started off after school or after schooling um, at Nielsen. So that was a market research company. Did, was there for about four years, did some uh, data specialist work, market research work, and then progressed and found my way to Mars um, roughly about five years ago. So at Mars, uh, it was a new world for me. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. I didn't know there was the there was the side of things, but it was a lot of learning for me. I learned a lot about Mars, about this consumer goods, consumer packaged goods industry. That's where I find myself. So I learned a lot about that. And over the last five years, I've been working in a few different roles, like uh, my current role, customer activation, or category management in the past, or even you know a sales analyst when I joined the company. So. That's been, I guess, a very quick summary of my journey, but I'm sure there might be more questions. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, feel free to, 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 to ask or to raise a hand, but that's a summary of, of my journey. My passions are things like data analytics. I'm very big on, on data. <clears throat> that's why I went back to school to do my master's in data analytics because I decided that was where I want to focus outside of work and fun professional stuff. I love music, I love sports. Um, um don't, not really too involved in a lot of clubs but you know i try to get involved in extracurricular curricula whether it's tutoring or or mentoring so this is a great opportunity for me actually to to give back so thank you again david and the fresh start hub for having me all right thank you so much tamiwa for that very interesting introduction um you you said some very interesting things that i would um like to and while other people are putting their questions together and sending us their question um you said you 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 had you did your undergrad in math and economics right and yeah. um but when you graduated from university was it just a kick walk was it just like oh you're done school now here's a job how tell us about your, that experience of getting your first opportunity and what, has, what were some of the challenges you had along the journey? Right. Um, it was not a cakewalk. <clears throat> I, I, I wished it was going to be, or in my mind, I thought it was going to be a, a walk in the park or something very, very easy. However, it was an interesting journey because when I finished my undergrad, you know, it was kind of the usual. I was applying before graduation a little bit. I wasn't too serious my first mistake. I was applying before graduation, um, but even after graduation, I was still kind of applying. And I wasn't getting called, like I was applying for jobs that I felt I should be qualified to do this job. <clears throat> Not that it's a bad job or anything, just based on, you know, the criteria that was listed on the, on the job description. I'm like, yeah, I think I should fit this or my background, education and whatnot. But that actually wasn't the case. And, you know, it took about, I graduated in June. I actually didn't start working until January of the following year. So let's just say I was in the job market for six months. Um, and that journey was, I think it was an eye-opening one for me because I eventually evolved from thinking, yeah, I just graduate, you know, try and get good grades and somebody will call me and, you know, rescue me from, from the job market. And I evolved to realizing that I actually had to do things a little bit differently. 
yes, I could apply online. Yes, I could send my resume. Um, but how I actually ended up finding the job that I landed when I first finished school was very, it was a very active chase. So there was a job fair at McMaster. I went, I attended, um, I met the company, the company was Nielsen. And they said, oh, we're looking for people that are graduating next year. They were doing campus recruitment. So they weren't looking for recent grads. They wanted people in third year that are graduating or fourth year graduating next year. So I told the lady, I'm like, okay, that, that's fair. Um, would you take my resume? She's like, yeah, no, not really. They wanted new grads. I'm like, okay, fine. That was one person that I met. This, I actually eventually ended up turning around and going to somebody else in the same meeting, in the same job fair. Because I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. She doesn't want, she's not, look, that's not, she's not, I'm not who she's looking for. But I went to someone else in the same company, in the same room, but I don't think she's a lady real. I didn't tell her I was going to someone else. I just kind of turned around and saw another lady. I'm like, oh, hey, you know, my name is Tom White. I just graduated. I'm looking for a job. If you have, you know, an internship or co-op, whatever, like I'm willing to do something. I was really interested in the company. And the lady actually took my resume. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. We'll, uh, we'll see what we have. We don't have anything right now, but if there's anything, they'll probably let me know. She took my resume and probably about two weeks after I got a phone call from HR. And apparently the lady I was talking to, I didn't know at the time, was the VP of HR. The first person I spoke to was just like the high, uh, HR business partner. So the person that actually took my resume <laughs> was the most senior person in HR in Canada, but I didn't know because I just, I just approached somebody different. And that was actually how I landed my first job. So it was like, I didn't even know about the company when I finished school. It was a career fair on campus that I attended, that I learned about them, went back for the follow-up session, ended up handing my resume to somebody that was going to make a decision, thank God, <laughs> and eventually got called for interviews, and I went and got a job offer, and I moved from Hamilton to Markham, so that was another thing. I had to move, and even going to Markham from Hamilton at the time, I didn't have my license, my second mistake. I didn't have a car, uh, so I took transit from Hamilton to Markham you know, the day of the interview and whatnot. And it was a journey, but it was one that was like, okay, I need to, you know, think bigger than I was originally thinking when I was in school. I know that was a long answer. Oh, sorry, I'm mute. Yeah, that's a very good answer because I like the storytelling part. I like the way you were able to take us through the whole experience. Um, so, but but there's something there's something very interesting in your story that you know you actually saw that somebody said no to you but you still went ahead to um um ask someone else what mm. was it about that organization that made you to say okay this is the particular one because there there were a lot of companies at the job fair on that right. day right yeah no i think personally i've been pondering like what do i want to do and for me, it was, there was a little bit of confusion. Doing economics and math, I was interested in numbers. I was interested in finance, kind of, but not hardcore. I wasn't interested in like hardcore finance or full-on banking. I applied to a lot of bank jobs. Like every bank job I could find, I applied to. But when I found out about the company, in my mind, I'm like, this makes sense. Like I could see myself, I think maybe that was it. I could see myself working there. And I could see myself enjoying the kind of work that was happening there, like market research and you know, understanding how consumers behave and how consumers um, interact with products and stuff. It was kind of what I was looking for when I went into economics. So it had the quantitative and the qualitative side of things. So the, immediately I heard the company, I'm like, I've never heard that company before. They were telling me what they did and you know how they collect data from retailers and analyze it and do a lot of market analysis. And I'm like, ah, right, this would be great. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's why I actually, even after the job fair, went for the info session. And I was like, even if I get like an internship, a, a co-op, unpaid work, which I would not encourage, but hey, I mean, I was open to any opportunity to just work with the company and be exposed to the company. So that was, I guess, why I was like, okay, this lady says she doesn't want someone that's already graduated. Let me just go to the next person and see, you know, maybe, maybe she wants something else. <laughs> yeah. And that's how, you know, that's basically how it worked out. Wow. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, you know, some, some especially you've, you've, you've talked with your name, Tomiwa, um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of 
um, news out there, if that's the right word, that you know people get discriminated based on mm -hmm. their name, or you know, so people, for example, my first name is not David. My first name is Olu Oluwashegu, mm -hmm. and I had to change it from that to David because mm -hmm. you know they would they would either mother your name or it will be right. difficult for them to even mm -hmm. you may not even get an interview. So. Um, for those people on this call who may be wondering, okay, who may probably have experienced something like that, have you have you at any point experienced something like that? And what advice or what's what's your um to what's your take on 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 people experiencing that or a situation like that? Right. Um. I think I've had a little bit, not too, too much, maybe because my name is a little easier to pronounce, but I've had a little bit of experience with that. And usually my, and my, I think based on my personality, my response is usually to educate people. So on the one hand, yeah, I get it's a different language. And one, I don't expect anyone to pronounce my name, like my full first, like Ade mm -hmm. I don't expect anyone who's not Yoruba or Nigerian to know how to pronounce it properly. However, knowing that you know I, I kind of wear it with confidence like if i go to an interview if i meet someone they ask for my name and i say tell me why i probably might have to spell it mm -hmm. and after spelling it i probably would have to explain where it comes from <laughs> so we get into conversations like yes i'm nigerian and you know the name has meaning and sometimes you get into the meaning is usually how i try to navigate it like, it can be upsetting at times but at the same time i think it's it's a two-way street. Like some people are willing to learn and they're open to learn where things come from, like where your name comes from. And I'm also willing to educate people. Like I've had some tough conversations with people at work that maybe try to make fun of it. And I'm like, no, it's not, it's not something to make fun of. It's it's my name and it has meaning. Um, and this is what it means. And still bring it back to a cordial note where to me, it's in, like opening people's eyes to the fact that there are other languages out there and there are names that are in other languages and they can learn to pronounce them like they've like we've learned to pronounce, I don't you know, a bunch of names that are in different languages. We all find ways of, of pronouncing them. Um, so yeah, like for me, it's it's been more about owning it and being comfortable with the fact that, yeah, my name is different and it might make my resume stand out or be difficult to read. But in addition to that, my value, personality, experience, you know, all those things that are truly what are valuable in, in an employee or in a person, to me, are not limited to my name. And if an employer can't get past my name to see my value or my experience or the value I can bring to the company, and this was my, my mentality, where even when I was applying for jobs, that's their loss, not mine. Like they lost the opportunity for me to work at the company. It sounds a little conceited, but <laughs> it was how I coped with a bunch of rejections um, because I'm just like, oh, well, it would have been great to work with you, but it's your loss <laughs> because I consider myself a great employee. Okay. So, you know, the first thing that I had, some people sent me emails or mm -hmm. messages on LinkedIn um, when I posted about this particular event and they said, what is Mars, right? Like, um and i had to just copy paste what i found on google to them and said you know this is it's like one of the largest confectionery company in the world um so some some people on this call are looking to get into your space the confectionery industry and some are interested into getting um you know a data analysis role or into the data space mm -hmm. um can you tell us about like what's for those people on this call who may be thinking okay um i want to get into that space what kind of what are some of the skill sets that they need to have and how should they navigate that that part of of their journey so it's it's a two-prong question uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot um to it and also i would encourage i'll strongly encourage people everyone on this call please ask question um just raise your hand you can use the reaction button to raise your hand or you can send your question directly to me or put it inside in the chat and um, we'll get to it the goal of this conversation is to make it, the goal of this session is to make it as conversational as possible and um Tommy Wai is here to answer whatever question you might have that has to do with you know whether it's his career path his industry or even at the company you know so 
please ask questions, please ask questions. So tell me why you can take it away while um, people send in their questions. Okay. Okay, sure. So I guess the first question was, what skill sets will people need to consider, right? Like, yes, yes. Are. Okay. Um, I'll start off with maybe talking a little bit about Mars. So to your point, Mars, as I've come to learn, is a global company. Um, they're private. They have different branches or different uh, segments within the, the Mars business. So Mars Wrigley is actually the confectionery branch or the confectionery segment of the company. And confectionery being chocolate, candy, gum, mints. Um, so things like Mars, Snickers, Twix, Bounty, M&Ms, Maltesers, all those different chocolate brands um, are on the chocolate side. Excel gum, Five Gum, Hubba Bubba, if you love chewing gum, there's that. And then there's obviously like Excel mints and Skittles, Starbursts, Lifesavers, candy. That's the Mars Wrigley side. Um, there's also a pet food division, which has brands like Pedigree, Whiskas, <clears throat> Temptations, Iams, um, and then also a food food. I call it food. It's food brand, a food uh, arm of the business, which has things like Seeds of Change or Ben's Rice. It used, used to be Uncle Ben's. I think now it's called Ben's. Right, so that's the third division, and there's other divisions like horse care globally, and um, and the symbio science uh, outside of Canada. But needless to say, there's a lot of different divisions within Mars, and within those divisions, you know, you have different roles like sales, finance, marketing, customer activation, uh, supply chain, demand planning. Like, there's a bunch of different opportunities there. Um, that the company actually encourages people to move around different functions. Now, in terms of skill sets, um, because it's a private company and there's a lot of divisions, obviously they value people who are entrepreneurial. You know, sometimes there can be a lot of ambiguity. Thing processes are not always the most fleshed out. Or if you want to take an initiative and go after something, they encourage that. So that's one thing. It was even in my job interview when I was joining the company was how do you deal with ambiguity? I'm like, um, why am I being asked this at a big company? I thought everything would be set in stone, but it wasn't because there was no process. It was because they encourage people to take initiative. You know, there's behaviors that they like to see, like people acting like an owner, thinking enterprise, um, being a team player. Like they encourage a lot of that. So I think any experience that you have that can draw on or that you can draw examples from those to demonstrate those initiatives will go a long way. And the other thing that Mars is also big on is the five principles. So there, if you go, if you're on the Mars website, you'll see there's, you know, five principles that are the pillar of the organization. Uh, it's freedom, quality, responsibility, mutuality. And there's one more that I'm forgetting, but it'll come back to me. Um, but the company also operates and lives on these principles um, in that, you know, everything that we do as employees, or even if you're not an employee, third-party vendors that we deal with, you know, we try to live by those principles, which I also found very insightful because it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have experience in the industry to be able to join Mars, even though experience is valuable. But even if you can demonstrate those principles, um, like, you know, the quality of your work or taking responsibility or being a mutual team player and things like that, then those things will also go a long way, I think, in the interview process or even if you're talking with the company. The other thing in terms of skills are would be, I would say, if you know areas where you have strength or where you want to focus, um, then that's another way to really sharpen, for example, your resume or your value proposition. So if you're a marketing specialist and you really want to, you know, go into the marketing area, um, I can obviously answer questions about that, but understanding, you know, where exactly you want to fit. You know, when I was joining Mars, I was looking into like data analysis, category management, that was the future trajectory of what I was thinking about. Um, and I was lucky enough to get a role in that. But even after joining, I realized that they don't necessarily want you to stay <laughs> in that function. There's that, you know, versatility and agi learning agility, I think is another skill, being able to learn things quickly that the company really values because yeah, you might not always have the experience, but they'll still give you a chance. If they see you've demonstrated principles, you've demonstrated behaviors, you have examples, whether it's work or even outside of work, of um, of things that resonate with the company and with the company's values. 
Um, thank you so much for, for that. Um, so I have a question here um, from Ram Prakash. He said, I would love to hear about how to start the career in data science field. I have three years of experience in software engineering. I've applied for tons of jobs, even for which I think I'm overqualified. Still, I'm not getting any interview calls. Hmm. Okay. Um... I mean, I probably would ask a few questions in return, but from my point of view, I can I could see how transitioning into data science specifically can be challenging. But with the background of software engineering, I'm sure Ram Prakash that coding is probably not your challenge. Um, I'm, you probably, um, and let me know if I'm wrong, you probably would have a portfolio of data science initiatives that you've done and maybe like a blog or something like that, a GitHub page, like if you have that, I think that was, that's also a good way to get into the field. The only other thing I can imagine because you said you've applied for tons of jobs is my, my only other question is, you know, is there anyone in your network that can introduce you or potentially refer you to some of those roles? Because like I said, in, in my early days, I applied to a lot of, like I probably sent 150 applications a day when I started looking for work and for things that I also thought I was overqualified for. But the job I ended up getting was a very active and proactive acquisition in that I met someone, like handed my resume, had the conversation and then eventually led to an interview. So I think maybe my other question would be, are you networking with people in the data science field and people that can either refer you or even give you an opportunity to showcase what you can do um, outside of you know just the job applications. That would be one thing. The other thing would be, I'm sure there's keywords on resumes and I don't know if you're using any resume help to make sure that your resume is looking as sharp as it can be, especially in the data science field. What I found is there's a lot of keyword searching which I, mean, I wouldn't necessarily agree is the best practice, but a lot of resumes get filtered out based on what is not in the resume, or if there's not specific words or, or models or things like that um, in the recruiting world. So that'll be the other thing, just making sure that your resume resembles or looks representative of someone that's getting into data science, as opposed to being a software engineering resume where you might get filtered out. But those would be some of the questions I have. So, so um, Ram Prakash just replied. Ram, Ram Prakash, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask the uh, um, and uh, and answer those clarifying questions, or do you want me to ask the one you just sent? Yeah, uh, I think I can ask. Uh, okay. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. I can. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Like, uh, I have some few networks uh, in LinkedIn, uh, like uh, a lot of connections, uh, but I have never spoken to them. Like, uh, uh, I don't know how to like start uh, asking them like to refer to a job or like help me get uh, introduced to someone uh, in hiring or something. So that's the problem. Right. I don't know how to get started. Right. Okay. No, and th thanks for sharing. I think um, if you can now, I. The first thing I would say is, you know, you probably won't, you don't want to approach someone on LinkedIn for the first time, just asking for a job. You probably won't do that unless they're open to that conversation. But what I could recommend is, you know, if there are people in your, in your network that are in the field that you want to get into, even if you want to start by booking a 30 minute chat, just to learn about their experience, learn about their company, ask them questions. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a request for a job right away, but I think it's worth you tapping into that network to ask, you know, some of these people who are in the field that you want to get into, what are what are they doing there? How are they finding it? What tools do they use? What challenges do they need to overcome? What skills do they need to acquire so that you are, when you're also speaking the language or needing to prepare, you're preparing yourself to get to that point. Or these people can also tell you, here are the watch outs, here are the do's and don'ts of looking for a job in data science. Here's what our company is looking for. And eventually you might get to the point of, yeah, and we're also hiring or we're not hiring, but I know someone who's hiring. But I think just being open to connecting with these people and asking questions could go a long way in changing the dynamic of a job search. So like if you, I would say go into any conversation with an open mind, 
not everyone's going to accept your invitation to chat or connect. Some people will, some people won't, but that's okay. It shouldn't stop you from still persevering to chatting with people, asking questions, learning about what people are doing. And event it's almost, it's almost like you're knocking on doors. So just keep knocking on different doors because you never know who's going to open it. So I would say tap into your, your network and ask a lot of questions, learn what, what happens in the field, what they're, what they're looking for. And, you know, if it's not showing up in your resume, you might have to tweak it. Or if it's not showing up on your LinkedIn profile, you might have to tweak it. But I think you will eventually get something in the field that you're looking for if you do that. Thank you, Tanawa. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Ram Prakash, um, did, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So, um, Tanawa, there's a question from Timmy. She said, how do mm -hmm. you handle ambiguity at work? You get a project and you run into handling so many moving parts, such as people, technology, and the rights of expectations. Right. That was a loaded question. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I think with that kind of ambiguity, what I've learned so far is it's is, is what you put at the end. It's that managing expectations portion. So work and personally i'm even still going through this a lot of times there are things that maybe are possible or processes that are not cleaned up and you know it just needs somebody to strangle the thing and take control and take the reins and when you end up doing that it's a good behavior to demonstrate i think one of the biggest ways and the most important ways to handle that kind of ambiguity is knowing who the stakeholders are to begin with like who's vested in this initiative who does this impact who is getting some kind of benefits or negative impact from this initiative, if anything gets done. And I guess from a design thinking perspective, meeting with those people, contracting with them and letting them know, say, this is what I'm seeing. Pro the process sucks. If the process sucks, you can just call it what it is. You know, Confront the reality that this is not working. Maybe it is. I think we need to do something about it here. And this is what I think, like you can bring your proposal. This is what I think needs to be done. This is what I think is possible. And if you know these stakeholders and you're able to contract with them and say, are you aligned to us having six months, eight months? I don't know how long it's going to take, but the alignment is the most important thing. Aligning with stakeholders that this is what you believe needs to be done. This is what it's going to take, the resources that are going to be required. And it's almost like a, not, you're not asking for permission, but because these people have a vested interest in what you're about to do, um, you want to make sure they're invested in your success as opposed to kind of running with something in the background and nobody knows what you're working on. Then you show up and say, I have a solve. And then they go, yeah, but we solved that six months ago, but we just haven't implemented it. You want to make sure that your work is being, or your thought process especially, is visible to the people that are stakeholders of what you're going to do. So in that sense, I think if you get that kind of alignment, you know, if it's senior leadership or your direct boss, with that kind of alignment, you can also get support to say, okay, yeah, I agree you should work on this, or I don't think this is worthwhile, either way. Um, and then they can say, we can help assign certain resources to you if you don't have direct management of people. Um, but with that alignment, you're basically tapping on the shoulders of people who are making decisions or you're influencing without authority, because that's pretty important. You don't necessarily have to be a boss to be able to influence. Um, you can tap on your boss and say, listen, this is what I see. This is what I think should be done. What do you think? You're aligned. Okay, how do we execute? I think that's one big step in handling the ambiguity because this person will also be your ally. If they want this to succeed, they will advocate for your project. They will dedicate resources to it if they can. And they'll also move things out of the way, especially in terms of like people and technology and expectations. If you're contracting with your senior leaders, and you're getting alignment from all of them. It might involve some meetings here and there, you know, one-on-ones and whatnot. But at that point, you won't be fighting an uphill battle or nobody will be surprised that you're working on something and it will clear some of the ambiguity because they would, they should even be driving for the same result as you to say, yes, we know, you know, if it's Timmy, we know you're working on this. We're aligned that you should be working on this. It's an organizational priority. So let us know if there's stuff we need to move out of the way. And then that way you can go back to your team and say, we have alignment that this is important and we're going to work on it. Um, and that hopefully should give some clarity, like if there's any ambiguous process. The other thing I would say is just documentation and carrying people along. 
Um, and by that, I mean, after you've maybe you've contracted with your senior leaders, you've got an alignment that this is important to do. Like being able to manage a vision and a purpose is pretty important to in, if there are people you need to communicate with or people that you need to tell that, hey, it might be the whole company. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is the end goal, the end result. Maybe we'll be done in three years. But just, you know, maybe getting up in a town hall or in a big enough meeting that the right people are there to say, this is what is happening. This is what to expect. And, you know, they can also align on, right, okay, I know Temi is working on this now. Maybe it will answer some of their questions ahead of time. But I think getting in front of those questions, preempting those difficult, you know, contradicting scenarios would go a long way in helping you down the line because you've planted the idea that, okay, I'm working on this. There's this project. If anyone has a question, they'll come to you versus the ambiguity of everyone kind of spinning and not knowing what's going on. So sometimes ambiguity in a nutshell is an opportunity to really take control of the situation and own the process, own the communication, and also own the execution and delivery if you can. Hopefully that helps. It was a long answer. Yeah. Timmy, was that helpful? I'm not sure if she... Okay. I might have scared her away. <laughs> <laughs> she said yes in the chat. <laughs> All right. So there's a question here. Um, yeah. The question is, what advice will you give to immigrants who tend to study or get certified in professional fields that they do not like? or have expertise in, or do so just to land a job? Because you got a job in a, com in a confectionery like Mars a, um, as a data analyst, which is great, even though you apply to several financial institutions. So um, for people who are trying to, you know, immigrant, um, I, I call them internationally trained professionals, they tend to just study mm -hmm. and say, you know what, let me just get certified. Let me get my PNP. Let me get my business analysis. Right. So right. because they said that's where you make six figures or whatever, like whatever they say out there, you know. Um, what, right. what would you, what advice would you give to them? Hmm. I'll say get experience. And when I say experience, I don't mean because you're trying to find a job. It doesn't mean like I'm trying to find a job. How do I get experience if I don't have a job? I mean, being open to the fact that this entire career work situation thing is not a sprint. Like if, if we're going to work, if you're going to work at a company or your entire career for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, there's no rush per se or the process might not look as straightforward as you have in your mind so when i say get experience i'll use a story to demonstrate that while i was applying for my or while i was after i graduated in june and i was applying for work for you know six months i actually started uh, i got a job through someone i knew hardwood flooring I had nothing to do with my school <laughs> nothing to do with my background it was you know getting up in the morning taking the bus going to with a contractor that allowed me and took me on to people's houses and you know we're ripping up the floor we're cutting wood we're measuring and eventually taught me a lot of stuff that i didn't know before i wasn't using those skills before but it kept me busy one i learned a new skill two um but it was also something that i could talk about when i was actually applying for jobs <laughs> as funny as it is it wasn't related to my resume or anything but it was just another aspect of my life that, you know, I guess you can showcase your experience or your skill or that you can add value. Um, I think that's also, so when I say get experience, I mean, yes, you can apply for specific jobs um, or study specific, you know, designations and things like that, but don't ignore the experiences you can get along the way, even if it has nothing to do directly with, you know, what you have in mind, be open to the fact that, yeah, you could do some hardwood flooring or you could do, you could work at a restaurant or whatever the case may be. Um, it doesn't mean you also, it doesn't mean you lose sight of the vision that you have. Like if you're going after your PMP or a business analysis or data science, you're not losing sight of that, but you're just opening your mind to the fact that, you know, you can land that as you work towards it. And you can also land a lot of other things along the way that can get you there because you never know who you're going to interact with. So when I say get experience, it's about that. Yes, work towards your certification or your degrees. And to the earlier question of, you know, if you don't like it 
or if it's not something you're passionate about or you just did it because you know it was just the, the sexy thing to do everyone's getting a data science certificate so you did it um i'll say be true to yourself you know you can you can work hard at something you hate and maybe eventually bring yourself to like it or because there's so many options in life you can confront the reality that yeah i did this thing don't necessarily love it maybe i love parts of it but not all of it there's probably somebody out there in this life, in this world, that is doing something similar to what you want to do. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no new career path that's going to erect that hasn't been around before. So, you know, get out there, find people, talk to people, network with people. And I think getting mentorship is also an important thing, especially when you're young and thinking about, oh, what do I want to do? What can I do? If when I was in university, I didn't have the perspective to understand the job market. I just knew, okay, yeah, there were certain jobs, you know, in banks and stuff, but I didn't really, really, really understand how the job market works, what jobs were out there. So mentorship and you know, meeting with people who have been there, who have done that, who have been where you are and can advise you, or, you know, if you're thinking about it right, or if you're not thinking about it right, or even if you have the right assumptions about the industry, there's so many things that you, we probably just don't know until we talk to the right people. So that would be another thing I say, just get that mentorship get experience and that mentorship is part of the experience just get perspective outside of your own to make sure that you're seeing things the right way wow thank you so much for that um there's a there's another question here um the person said how do you move from sales representative to sales analyst what were your responsibilities as a sales rep uh, sales analyst the sales analyst okay Right. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, specifically for me, my responsibility as a sales analyst when I joined Mars, for example, where there was a lot of reporting, you know, pulling data, analyzing data, whether it's in Excel or, you know, presenting it in PowerPoint. I gave a lot of presentations um, and got a lot of exposure to senior leadership, just, I guess, as a young analyst to say, here's what's going on in the business. Here's where we should be you know, aware, here's what the competition is doing. Um, here's my recommendation, <laughs> even though I was an analyst with no perspective, I was given the opportunity to, to recommend things. Um, and in those meetings, I learned a lot about how leadership thinks, not because I was one of them, but because being in a room with them, you know, iron sharpening iron and whatnot, I started to see, okay, this is what these people care about. This is what they think about. This is how they think. So for my next analysis, I'm gonna add elements of all these things. Um, to bring back to them to obviously showcase that I'm listening. So that was my responsibility as a sales analyst. It was just analyzing the business and present to leadership what was going on. In terms of how you move from a sales rep to a sales analyst, I mean, it depends on the company you're, you're, you're in or the company that you're looking at. Um, one thing I'll say is if you're trying to move to any role, whether it's, for example, sales rep, sales analyst, if you understand or you're able to get an understanding of what it takes to be a sales analyst, then you have something that you're working towards. So for me, when I was a sales analyst, and I wanted to get into category management. I met with the leader of the category management team and asked, what are you looking for, for in a category manager? What skills do you need? And they told me a few things, you know, like presentations, being customer facing, giving customer presentations and whatnot, whatnot. And for me, the next question was, so how do I get those skills? Or how do I get that exposure? How do I get that experience? Because that's really all, all it is. If, you're, if you demonstrate that you can handle the experience or the expectations of that role, you can get the role. So I think if you're currently a sales rep and you can get visibility either by talking to the manager or whoever it is that's responsible for the sales analyst side of things, if you can get exposure to what it takes to be a sales analyst, and then work towards getting that experience, that exposure. It's almost like you operate at that level of a sales analyst before you even get there. Then you have a good chance of being able to, you know, be promoted into the role or switch into the role. Either way, if, if you show that initiative, ask the questions, get the experience and the exposure, and you really drive that. Like no one's gonna come pull you and be like, oh, we think you'd be a great analyst just because, you know, they wanna be nice. Sometimes that happens. But more often than not, you know, you're in the driving seat of your experiences and the experiences that you want. So if you know what they are, I'll say do your best to try and get them. You might have to go above and beyond. 
you might have to do a little more than you know you were doing in the past but that's what it takes to grow so i'll say that would be my advice i guess would be get those experiences all right thank you so much um Pamela, for that um very robust answer i would say um you went back to do your masters you went back to school what informed that decision? Because to follow up question, to follow up on the last, um, the second to the last question of, you know, immigrants coming to this part of the world and saying, you know what, you know, um, what's the in thing right now? And they spend a lot of money going back to school. Um, what informed that decision for you? And what's your, what, what advice do you have for people who may be considering going that route. Right. Um, for me, going back to school for my master's, it was, I think for, it was a realization that informed the decision for me. So when I finished my undergrad and I worked, this was, I worked from let's say 2013 till 2016, I realized, okay, this is an industry, consumer goods. You know, these are the types of roles, category management and marketing. I, I had an understanding of the market the job market and then I also had an idea of what I was passionate about things that I enjoyed like the number aspect of things you know the data side of things I didn't know much about data science actually I didn't know anything about data science throughout my undergrad or anything like that it was after I started working started having conversations I used to you know just poke around when things uh, came up in the company I would ask questions if I heard some global guy speak and he talked about something I'm like oh that's interesting I would book a meeting with him eventually that curiosity landed me in the aspect of okay there's this realm of data science and analytics and machine learning and the whole you know all these buzzwords that we throw around and then I realized okay I have a background in mathematics and stats I enjoy this stuff I'm already on the business side where we're using this stuff or at least we're trying to use these things um, to me I saw an opportunity where in consumer goods there was a bit of a gap we don't they were not heavy on data science or analytics. They were a bit behind. Now things are caught up. But that was the realization that led me to think, you know what, if I want to focus on this thing and I want to get dangerous and I want to learn more, why not study it? And by studying it, it was, you know, if I want to study, why not get a master's degree? So for me, getting the master's was, you know, a lot of new areas, a lot of new experiences, new concepts, coding. I mean, I did a little bit of coding, but barely. But, you know, when I looked at the program and I saw what they were offering, I'm like, okay, this is perfect because it's going to introduce me to all the concepts that are, you know, in the industry. I'm going to learn all these new skills and tools and even the aspect of meeting people. So I was basically hungry for knowledge at the point of where I was going to do my master's. I wanted a new skill set. I wanted to learn how to code. I wanted to learn, you know, the, the math and stats behind machine learning and all those things. And I wanted, you know, a, a deeper school experience than just, grades I had you know I had my undergrad to remember that my approach in undergrad was just grades now I'm like okay I'm working I have an idea of where I want to go I see this program it looks like it's going to feed me what I need to, to sharpen or to get some experience in this area that is new-ish to me um, so I went for it and thankfully it worked out and I applied I got in did the program it was tedious but that was the realization for me that you know there's there's an area that I think I can sharpen my skill there's programs that are out there um, and hopefully that when I'm done with the program, I'm more valuable and I have more knowledge to be able to apply in the workplace. Right. Um, so there, there's a question someone just sent in, but I would ask you a follow-up question that you just said mm -hmm. now um, before I ask this one. Um, you, 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 you said something to, when you were rounding up now that, you know, you knew that you wanted to get into data science and you went back to school. But right after your graduation, was it just like automatic? Now you're done school, you apply for the first job, boom, and you thought you got in. How, how was that experience like for you? Right. That experience is actually still unfolding. So right after graduation, I did get a new role, but it was, was it automatic. A, no, no, it was not automatic at all. Um, it was it was actually through, a, I guess, like a reshuffling in the organization, not because of my master's degree. So I got a new position, but it even till date, it doesn't revolve around data science. Mm -hmm. 
So a big part of my journey currently for the last three years since I finished school has been me, it's almost like fighting an uphill battle, injecting elements of analytics and data science and whatever I can um, grasp into the roles that I currently find myself. Mm. Um, so the, in, in the sense that journey has been, yeah, what I did in school is not necessarily what I do for my day job now, it will be eventually in the future. Mm -hmm. But it's given me an opportunity and the way I went around it was, it gave me a platform to be able to go back to the business and say, hey, there's these things that we could do that are possible that either I've learned or I'm seeing happen globally. What about we try doing these things for Canada? And then leadership team says, sure, go for it because they encourage that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. And that has actually landed me a lot of exposure to my general manager, to the senior leadership team. I actually got into a reverse mentorship with my general manager at the time because he was like, okay, you know so much about this data stuff and all this analytics. You know, let's have monthly connects and sessions on what we should be doing as a business. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what initiatives are you driving? I started doing a lot of above and beyond projects that maybe they were happening globally, but Canada was not a part. And I would say, okay, yeah, we have someone in Canada that can manage this or that can tap into this. So in a sense, you know, I still had the business side of things, which is customer activation and sales strategy that mm -hmm. I've been doing. But on top of that, I'm basically now seen as like a data analytics expert within the company, even though we don't have a position for it. So it's a lot of work, but the fact that it hasn't necessarily happened right after my school or anything, um, you know, largely due to the fact that I saw an opportunity to just elevate the roles that I was in. Like, yes, I can do my role. Plus there are these added things or added value that I can add to the company in these capacities that obviously get recognized and you, you know, get awarded for. But it wasn't automatic from, you know, after school, you know, finish my master's and then boom, it could have been, I could have, you know, gone to a different company or a tech company or just kind of jump ship or whatever. But I personally chose the, some of my friends say the hard journey of trying to elevate my role, elevate the business, inform the business about what's possible, which has been interesting so far. Thank you so much for that. So I will go to, to the next question now. Um, the person said, how has mentorship influenced your career goals? Mm. Did, you have a, did you have to find a mentor for each new role you took on? If yes, how did you go about building those relationships? Right, right. That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> so for me, mentorship has been, it has looked like a few different things, but mostly it's been a lot of advice. So like I said, when I, I mentioned earlier that when I finished school, I didn't have a lot of perspective about the job market you know, or how the job market works. It was like, okay, maybe if I get good grades, I get a good job. If I do well in the job, you get a promotion, you know, yada, yada, yada. But what mentorship has taught me from the people that I've been exposed to was, you know, some people are willing to take you on if you make the, the step or if you take the step. So some of the mentors that I've had and still have are people who, you know, them. I notice what they do and I just booked a meeting and say, hey, I see you are the, you know, maybe manager or VP director of something. I just want to chat, talk about your experience. That was, that was my main way, I guess, of getting mentors was asking questions about their experiences to try and learn from it. You know, usually with these people, like a lot of people who are open to talking to you telling you about their experience, telling you about what they think are the do's and don'ts if you book time with them. But it hasn't necessarily been one for every role. There's just been key people who I found were very open. And when I asked them, you know, for help, they were willing to avail themselves and lend time to, to talk to me and give me insight about what they see in me. So even my own feedback and then what they see is possible from a career standpoint. So the way it's influenced my career growth is, opening my eyes to the reality of either the company or the job market. So, you know, if, for example, within Mars, there's certain elements of skills that they look for or that they encourage, and I'm not looking in that direction, then it's like, okay, within this company, these are things that, you know, are really celebrated. If you want to, you know, stay, learn and grow with this company, focus on these areas, you know, focus on being customer centric, focus on, um, being mutual and showcasing examples of, you know, mutual growth for the customer and yourself, things like that, where you might not necessarily be thinking about if you're just thinking about a job or a job title. Um, but mentors have taught me 
to think about the experiences that I want instead of just the job titles that I want. Um, and for that, for me, that has meant taking my eyes off a little bit, just a title or a particular pay band and focusing more on what experience do I want next? Do I want to manage people? Do I want to dive more into data? Do I want to you know, lead more strategy? If those are the experiences I want, how do I get myself in positions that I'm talking to people that can get me there versus I just want to be um, a category manager. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a title and it's fine. It's not bad to aspire to that. But if you don't know the experiences that come with that role, you might not want it when you get there. <laughs> so mentors have shown me that, you know, the experiences you want can be more important than just the role or the title. So really folk, like understanding them, being honest with yourself about what experiences you're looking for. And then when you get that and you learn them, you know, you, you, you keep building out the relationship. I think the last part of the question was, how do you go about building those relationships? It's it starts with a conversation. It starts with whether it's coffee or if you can meet face to face, because hopefully COVID is over. You know, chatting and saying, "This is what I'm trying to do. What do you think?" Being open, being open to feedback. Like I've asked a lot of senior leadership people. I tell them, "This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm trying to do. What do you think? Like, where is your head? Where is your head at? What do you think about this idea or this part of the company?" And being open to hearing feedback on your own thoughts, but then also learning from people who have gone ahead. And who can see the bigger picture because that's i think that's really what mentorship is about is learning from people who have seen the bigger picture to inform your small little picture um i like the i like the way you summarized everything um at the end of at the end of your, your talk all right so so there, there are lots there are a few um, students on this call who are, you know, at the point of, they're asking a lot of questions like, what do I do next? Um, what, how do I navigate my career journey? Um, I know you, you you told us a little bit about, about yours um, earlier on, but, you know, what advice would you give to those people, those students who are trying to navigate their journey right now, especially the international students who are very limited, you know, they have very limited time. They have, um, they, they, some of them want to apply for their permanent residency at the end of it, but there are some criteria for, for them to be able to do that. What's, right. what's, what's looking back on your own journey now, what would you have done better um, while you were in university or what would you suggest to them? Mm -hmm. I, I think I think that answer would might also answer it for some people who are also new to Canada who came as, right. as um, internationally trained professionals too. Right, right. Okay. If I could go, well, I can't go back. The one thing, or one of the things I would do differently as a student, especially if I'm, maybe I'm not graduating, too soon um, would be to get experiences outside of school. So I didn't do a lot of, you know, summer internships and things like that, that maybe were available or were not even available as part of the schooling or part of the study. But from what I've seen, those internships go a long way, just in terms of your experience, your exposure, your perspective, like the way you think. Um, so I would say, if you can, get an internship or doesn't mean it's unpaid like this is a you know a paid position apply for them companies usually have these these um opportunities for students to join for three four months and then you work even mars has an, an internship program um, i would say do it if you can because one of the biggest skill sets you can get as a student even before you graduate is you're learning agility and not just learning like textbook or you know equations, but learning how to adapt in the workforce, learning how to be relatable, approachable, how to ask questions, how to learning how to learn in a sense, because you can learn your, you know, your studies and your books and whatnot. But when you get into the workforce, you're gonna learn how to, you know, be social, how to open up, how to engage with people, have conversations, casual, non-casual, tough, easy, like. There's a lot of soft skills that you learn from being in a workforce and learning from people that are more senior. So if you have the chance as a student, I cannot stress it enough, 
if you can, you know, work outside of your schooling time, you know, during your holidays or you can get an internship, I would say 100% go for it. Um, for internationally trained professionals, I know it's, it's a little bit different because you're not necessarily, you might not be looking for an internship, but if there are experiences that you can get, I'll say get it. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we land in on the positions that we, we envision and we see and we want, we land there right away. Sometimes it, it could take, you know, a stepping stone like me, me doing hardwood flooring, which I still laugh at today because it was a fun experience. I learned a lot. Or even working at, there was this restaurant near McMaster, Right Wingers. And I used to buy it a lot. And then one day I'm like, what if I just ask the guy for a job while I'm looking, you know, during the summer. And then I ended up working at Right Wingers. <laughs> and then I didn't have to pay for the food all the time. But <laughs> but that was, you know, another experience where it was, you know, I went from thinking about just, you know, this end job that I want to you know, in the time being, in this three, four, three, four months of space, what can I do that's, you know, valuable to whoever the employer is, whether it's right wingers or it's a hardwood flooring or even tutoring. That was another thing that I did out, like in between spaces of either work or even after work, just, you know, imparting the knowledge, you know, adding value where you can, I'll say um, is one area. And to the point of like, how do you navigate your career? And you know, what do I do next? You can make plans, but I, like I think, like I mentioned before, if you talk to people who are maybe where you think you want to be, that can give you some guidance. So I actually initially thought I was gonna go into business analysis, like PMP, business analyst, because for some reason after school, I thought that was the title that I'm like, yeah, I love business analysis. And you know, I wanna be a project manager. I wanna get my PMP. And it's, I connected with some guys on LinkedIn or maybe a friend introduced me to some older guy. And he's like, yeah, if you want to, you know, be a business analyst, you got to get your PMP and you got to do this technician and this and this. And I looked into all those things. And when I looked into them, I'm like, is this what they do? I'm like, I don't want this. <laughs> but I didn't realize that I wasn't that interested until I actually spoke to someone who does it. And he told me the process and I looked into it. And I'm like, no, this is actually not really what I was looking for. But at the time, it was easy for me to just be like, oh, yeah, I want to be a business analyst. I want to do my PMP or be a project manager because the title sounded nice. That would be one thing I would say for students or even international um, trained professional. Don't be stuck to the title. Some titles are nice, you know, but the, the work, the day to day work is not what you want. So, again, if you can get visibility to what it is that you're thinking about, Talk to people who have been there, who have done what you think you want to do. Understand exactly like what is the day to day? How do they work? What did they do? How did they do it? It'll inform you more into you know what you can do next, or if you'll be excited about doing what you want to do next or not. I think a mistake a lot of international students or trained professionals make, maybe more so students, is thinking that the title says everything about what the work is or you see a title on LinkedIn and you just believe that, oh yeah, that's a great title and this must be amazing. And you need to talk to people and understand that, you know, jobs and work, it goes far beyond title. Some companies title down, some companies title up, some companies titles don't even make sense. But <laughs> when you get into the, you know, the day-to-day -day of your work and the job and the work that you're going to do, does it make sense for you? Is it meaningful to you? Does it resonate with what you want to do now or in the future? or the experiences that you're looking for. I think that is more important than just the title. So for young people who are thinking about what to do next, think about what experience you want next. If you want to be in a big office with lots of people, if you want to be in the back office crunching numbers, like think about those things and try and find people who are in those positions, talk to them, ask them what it's like, and then kind of you know make an informed decision from there. Right, um, thank you so much for that. Um, so is there, is there any place like, um, for people who are trying to get into your space, like get into your industry mm -hmm. or even to your organization, how best do you think they can prepare themselves to stand out? Um, you know, what, 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 what would you tell them to, to do mm -hmm. in order for them to be able to stand yeah. out? Right. Um, a few things. I mean, for one, let's talk. <laughs> we can talk, you know, if there's something that you're looking at, 
prospects. And if I can provide perspective, more than happy to, um, because internal referrals do go a long way as well in terms of you know getting noticed or getting attention. If you're referred by someone who is well regarded within the company, chances are you'll get at least a phone call. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by you know let's talk if there's something there. The other things I would say are you know make sure you sharpen your experience and your resume. If there's experiences that are listed in the job description that you have, make sure that it's visible, it's evident. Another thing I would say is be yourself. So for example, at Mars, they really value and encourage, you know, a you know, friendly, open culture where it's it's not necessarily about you know hiding things or trying to feel like you're better than anybody. If you're collaborative, you're a team player, you can add value, you have good experience, you know, you stand a great chance at Mars. Because I think the culture aspect is also a big um, consideration in the job search but in terms of you know skills like if you have the skills the experience or even if you don't um as long as you're able to learn and you can showcase that and there's that hunger um and you can potentially get a referral if there's an opening and you're qualified for i think you, there's a very good chance that you could get in and, and thrive you know because getting in or getting a phone call is one thing succeeding in interview processes is its, its own ball game <laughs> So, you know, reading through the job descriptions or, you know, I think at Mars, there's a lot of like, um, depending on the area, entry level positions or positions that, you know, would hire people who are maybe recent graduates or experienced professionals. Like, you know, if you want to be going to marketing as a brand leader or in, into sales as like a sales analyst, or even if you're more experienced, like you want to be a key account manager or a brand manager, like there's opportunities there. But I think being able to get your foot in the door through a referral um, definitely goes a long way. And at least, at least to getting a phone call, you know, going past that screening stage or just being in a pile of resumes, um, definitely do that. And I'm more than happy to, to refer. If anybody's looking, you know, we can chat, we can talk about what experience you're looking for or what position you're looking at. And I can give more insight as to, yes, that is the position that's available or at least be able to share more information about it. All right. Okay. So um, there's a follow up question to what you just said. Now you you spoke about you know people asking for referral, and I'm sure that um, even maybe since I started posting about mentioning your name on post, maybe you started getting like a lot of uh, connection <laughs> requests and all that. But let's that's not my my question is from your experience. Tell us about people who have done, who have asked for that referral in a smart way versus the people who have asked in a way that it's it's so you you were you were very you were not excited to refer them so that people can right. just best practices of you know right. um, what you think that people should have, how people should approach getting referrals from from other people especially on LinkedIn because there's an LinkedIn is like gold mine of opportunity if you use it well, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. if you don't use it well, you might be just. So if you can, if you can tell us like best yeah. practices. Yeah. Okay. In your own experience, <laughs> just from your own experience. Yeah. You know, you know I, I'm, I'm laughing because I know <laughs> I've made some of the mistakes that I might mention, not so long ago. <laughs> but either way, um, I think maybe rule number one of trying to get a referral is not leading in with, I want a referral. <laughs> so especially if there's someone you've never spoken to, maybe they're at a company you want to work at. And the first thing you say is, hi, my name is Tamuwa and I want a referral for this position. It's like, okay, great. I don't know you, don't know who you are. And I cannot vouch for the quality of work that you do or the kind of person that you are. So maybe step one would be, you know, connect with people. And when I say connect, not just, you know, I hit connect on LinkedIn and I'm done, but have conversations meet with them, get to know them, get to know what they do, get to know about their company. Yeah, it might be obvious that you're looking for work and you can even put the badge on your LinkedIn, you know, open to work. Um, but when you're talking to these people, be truly, I think if you're genuine, if you're genuinely curious and yeah, you, they might sense your hunger and your passion, but you don't have to over communicate the fact that you need a job now, now, now. Sometimes the people you're asking for a referral are not even the decision makers. They don't hold the hiring power for the role. They might just know the person. So I would say build the relationship first. That's the first thing. 
build relationships. It might be one, it might be multiple. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're only building a relationship because you want to refer on. You know, people are not just a means to an end, as much as LinkedIn might seem that way. Like if you genuinely build relationships with people, it's easier to have a conversation and say, hey, I'm interested in this opportunity. What do you know about it? Versus the first bridge in the relationship is, hi, I want a referral. Um, so I'll say, like, even if you're not job searching, just build relationships. When you connect with people, when you when people connect with you, you know, if you want to learn more and just know more, build a relationship. It may go somewhere, it may not. But step one is don't lead with referral requests. <laughs> At least in my experience, it hasn't really happened well that way. And I think the other thing too would be, you know, really being, and I'm trying to say this in a polite way, really being realistic with your experience and how it matches with what the company is looking for. A lot of times people want a referral to a job title. Again, we mentioned this whole thing about titles. They, they see the title, they like it yeah, I like that job title. And they've barely read the job description. Their experience of the resume barely talks about like how it matches what the company's looking for. But you magically want an employee to send your resume off and then you just get hired because you were referred. Oftentimes, you know, if the referral happens that way, the candidate might not succeed passing the reprocess because the company will realize, yeah, you want the title, but your experience and your, your skill set doesn't match what we're actually looking for, which was in the job description. So I'll say if you can understand what the company is looking for again by building a relationship, talking to the people that maybe you want a referral from and showcase how you can add that value or how you can meet that expectation or even exceed it, then that would be better than just kind of shipping off a resume, generic resume, um, or not even having the experience or being realistic with the fact that, yeah, I might need to spend a little more time developing this skill before I can apply or you haven't even read the job description because you just sent the title. I think that would also make a difference, not necessarily to the person that's referring you, but to the later steps of the referral process. If you get called for an interview, you, you want to have value and depth um, in the interview process. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's a question here by Adolua. Um, she said, how can you combine analytics with finance? Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure there's so many ways that you can do that. And I say that not because I'm in finance, but while I was in school, a lot of people in my class, in my master's program, um, were working in banks, or they still are working in banks. So some of the examples that they would, you know, go through are, for example, predictive analytics, where based off of maybe your shopping patterns and your, you know, bank app usage, what areas of the app you're clicking on. There could be algorithms that are trying to figure out or, or prescribe to you, you know, oh, it seems like based on all your clicks and your banking behavior, you might be looking for a mortgage. Then you get an email trigger saying, hey, here's the bank's mortgage rates and, you know, click here to apply. Usually a lot of those things involve some form of analytics to understand like what is the consumer behavior and then what, what need are they trying to fulfill that the bank can offer a service for. So sometimes it's a mortgage or sometimes it's, you know, you're looking at different tools on how to save and then you get an email about use this saving app from our bank. Um, those are some of the areas where analytics is used in finance or for example, even in risk management or risk analytics where, you know, fraud detection is a big thing. You might, there, there might be certain patterns that show up in whether it's credit card transactions or banking transactions that, when you run models, some models can predict that this account has a high likelihood, 90% chance of being engaged in a fraudulent activity. And that's sometimes how you know, banks use um, data and transactional dealings to identify high risks of fraud or things like that. But the, the analytics that goes into that, I personally don't know the full details, but I know these are some of the things that you know, the finance industry employs analytics to do to solve some of the problems or proactively get ahead of them. I should disclaim that I'm not a finance professional, so <laughs> don't quote me on any of that. <laughs> um, Adelua, um, did that answer your question? Yes, it did, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, so um, 
you you've said a lot today you've you've said a lot of very very insightful and interesting things um but you you also spoke about the fact that even though you're not where you want to be yet but um you're you're on that journey mm -hmm. um what does the future like what's what's what kind what does the future look like like do you have any plan what are your plans for the future um you know when it comes to your career right i'm planning to take over the world <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. um honestly my, my plans right now are to continue to at least the space that i've been in for the last couple of years has been to continue to learn so on the one side, yes, I'm learning as much as I can about my current space, about my current company and all that it offers and all that is available to learn because I don't know when I'm going to use it. I think I just like picking up random skills at some point. It's like, yeah, this could be a useful skill in life. Let me learn. And then the next thing. So that's one part of my mind. The other part of my mind is I'm still pushing for, and this is what I believe the future holds. I'm still pushing for opportunities in the data analytics space to dive, you know, 100% into it, as opposed to maybe 20%, 30% that I'm doing now, I'm still pursuing those opportunities. So if something comes up, more than happy to explore it. Um, but in my current capacity, also still pushing that agenda within my current company, knowing that it's an uphill battle. Again, I've chosen this hard, <laughs> call it hard life or hard road to do that, while, you know, at the same time, realistically, still being open to what other opportunities are out there. So for me, what the future holds is, I think I've made a pretty firm decision that I will pursue data analytics, regardless of what it looks like, but I'm being flexible to what that is. And while I you know, wait for that time and or press towards that time, learning as much as I can in the data analytics space. So still needing to try and stay sharp in you know whether it's coding, Python, or just knowing what the industry does attending conferences, watching videos on YouTube, staying informed because it's going to prepare me for where I want to go, mm -hmm. um, while also still trying to do the work of where I find myself currently doing it well, not being like, ah, that's not what I want to do. So you know, I'm barely going to try. No, I'm trying not to be in that mindset either. You know, If I'm here, I'm learning. There's a lot of value that I can add and things that I can learn along my way and where I'm going. I also need to learn and be prepared for that too. So that when the time comes, and it will, um, I'm ready to make that transition. Yeah, so so um, we have just 10 minutes left to go. Mm. I, I, um, you've emphasized on people getting experience. You, you've spoken a lot about it in the last couple of minutes, you know, that people should get experience. So for people who are trying to get into like the data analytics space, Mm -hmm. um is there any how can they start building the experience is there any publication any platform any websites or like that you can recommend for for people right um there are a lot of them okay um so personally i even used um data camp i use data camp just like just subscribe to it on my own um to get some of that experience udemy coursera udacity i've used udacity as well for data science certification the only thing i would say is a lot of these websites and tools and courses will tell you you know enough to start on anything data analytics related or give you enough information to get your feet wet it's almost like school all over again it's like academia it's like reading a book do a few examples, maybe you write an exam, you get some kind of certification or result, and then voila, you want to <laughs> jump into the job market and be like, I'm ready. Um, it's possible, but above and beyond that, I think getting into examples where you can apply the skills that you learn in these courses. So if it's, you know, a Kaggle competition, if you want to try your hand at that, if it's you know applying what you've learned to, I don't know, it could be your own personal transactional habits if you can analyze the data with what you've learned. But I think getting from the concept phase of just learning a bunch of tools on these websites to applying it and you know going after areas that maybe you're passionate about, you're interested in, if you like fashion, hey, maybe you can apply your skills to the fashion industry. But really showing that initiative, 
and spending that extra time because it will be extra time um you might have to sacrifice some things like tv shows netflix um spending that extra time to really apply your skills and prove to yourself that you can even do it because oftentimes we might do these courses and be like yeah i got a certification in data science so i deserve a job in data science maybe you do but you still have to prove it you still have to showcase that you can do it it's not enough to just know or think that you can do it mm-hmm. if you show that you can do it if you have examples you have a portfolio you have you know you're writing blogs or you're contributing to topics that are being discussed with your analysis with your skill set and i think that goes a long way in front of a recruiter or anybody that you talk to because it gives you context to talk about something that you have created you know a lot of these especially in data science or analytics a lot of the people that you find in there are people that you know they create content they do analysis on their own they dive into topics you know they put stuff out there so i'll say do that you know publish things research things analyze things if you want to do it you know day to day then showcase that you can do it or at least you can do elements of it and put it out there for people to see um i think that would be what i would say Right, that, that's a very interesting one. I, I completely agree with you, especially with, um, you said something using data to solve your own personal finance problem. Right. So um, like the knowledge you've, you've gained from some of those courses and it's, it's, it's easier to tell the story to an employer, um, a prospective employer, um when you're t- when you're telling them about how you've been able where you were before and how you've been able to use you know what you've learned to solve your own problem the how you built maybe a, a financial model that's that's you know yeah. helped you to be able to know the leak the leakages you had you had mm-hmm. in your finance um in your finances rather and some some other interesting things maybe you're overpaying for a certain bill and because you're able to do that, you found out that, oh my God, I've been, I've just been giving my money away to this company. And you made a phone call and you were able to solve to get some money back because of your of your skill. That's that's a good story to tell. So um, I found that I found that very, very interesting. So thank you so much, um, Tomiwa, for um, you know, spending one hour, 30 minutes of your time on a very beautiful um summer <laughs> summer evening when you could have been okay. spending that time with your with your beautiful newly um your beautiful wife um so <laughs> thank you so much for for spending that time thank with you. us um if you, we have just five more minutes if you have any more question mm-hmm. uh please feel free to ask Tomoa. but if not we'll just um round it up here thank you everyone for joining us today and like i said at the beginning of this call if you're interested in knowing more about the financial service industry you want to know more about um public public service um we have some very intro um or marketing hr the next person we have the next mentor is an expert in in hr and marketing um, and also in the financial service industry so if you're interested I would strongly encourage you to uh, to go register. Um, Wando, do you have your hands up? No, I was just clapping. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, no problem. All right. So, um, thank you all for for your time, and um, I hope that you got um, a few things or uh, very insightful things from what Tomiwa has shared with us today. So thank you so much, Tomiwa, and um, thank you, everyone. If you want, you can drop your LinkedIn profile in the chat and we can add each other. Um, And like I I, I put in the chat before, if you're interested in the Career Accelerator Bootcamp, um, in the free Career Accelerator Bootcamp, please feel free to complete the form through the link I just shared now. And, um, but outside of that, Enjoy the rest of your day and um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. So much, David. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.